lot of work is going on at the National Treasury over the next few days through the weekend and to Wednesday when the Finance Minister will present South Africa's first ever emergency budget. He's doing it in a calamity of an environment as far as the economy is concerned. This economy could shrink between 7 and 12 percent uh, this year. That is anything from three to six times worse than it was in 2008. It is a travesty of epic proportions. He's got to balance the books somehow, however. So three experts for you this evening on Taking Stock as we look at the big issues facing South Africa's budget in an economy that is flagging and struggling for oxygen. Our first guest this evening is Mpo Tsebe. Mpo is an economist at Rand Merchant Bank. It is unusual, isn't it, for an emergency budget? As far as I can recall, it's the first emergency budget that South Africa has tabled in our democracy, Mpo. Um, yes, it's very unusual, Bruce. Um, but you will admit that the change in the economic environment and economic outlook um, does warrant an emergency budget to be uh, tabled, um, especially because otherwise that would just leave us with the medium term budget policy statement in October. Um, I think investors are quite anxious to find out how several things have changed within the budget. Um, so hence the necessity to, to retable an emergency budget. What we do know, Mpo, is that the economy has fallen off a cliff. We know that companies are not reporting profits. We know that that is going to lead to an enorm- enormous tax shortfall. We know that many people are being laid off and therefore PAYE takings are going to be down. We know that VAT collapsed in a heap during the, the hard lockdown. The SIN tax collection disappeared. Fuel tax collection disappeared off the table. Um, the, the finance minister has got a budget shortfall this year to the tune of hundreds of billions of rand. His nearly two trillion rand budget that he announced in February this year is in tatters. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Bruce. So firstly, it's going to be the economic outlook. Um, Treasury is going to have to revise the economic outlook. So the economic outlook that we had in Jan and in Feb um, has you know, totally been thrown out, out the window. Uh, we're now expecting growth to contract anything between 7% and about um, 16%. So it's a huge contraction um, that South Africa is going to face this year. And as you correctly pointed out, this is going to affect revenue projections. Um, The expenditure side of the budget also has to be amended. Um, So just briefly on the tax revenue projections, um, we're likely to see, SARS estimates that uh, we could see a tax revenue shortfall of about 200 billion, um, if, if, if not more this year. So that's quite significant uh, because it's going to affect uh, the expenditure side of things as well. Uh, government is going to have to find uh, new funding um, for the current expenditure needs, uh, which cannot be easily readjusted. Um, so there's several things that government has also talked about uh, just on the sidelines. So in, in, as part of the stimulus package, there's also the 130 billion um, that is, is part of the stimulus package, which has to come from the current expenditure uh, baselines. So those are some of the key things that uh, we'll be looking for in the budget. Um, but just to go back on the tech side um, as well, we saw with the April tax data, which, which came out and it showed that tax revenue declined by about 9.1% year on year. And that's just the first month of um, the, uh, the new fiscal year. So the tax revenue shortfalls are going to be enormous. Um, you also talked about corporate tax. We saw corporate tax um, revenues in April alone fall by about uh, 60, 66%. So corporate income tax, so it's enormous. On the VAT side as well, um, we saw a, a slight contraction but the VAT numbers for April um, are, so, are sort of lagged. Um, we're only going to see the full impact of the lockdown on the VAT conditions with, with the May data. So what, what the finance minister's got to do here is he's got to take a much smaller cake and then, a bit like the Sermon on the Mount, 
try and spread this little bit of cake as far as possible. He's going to have to raise new revenue. Now, he can either come to you and me and say, I'm terribly sorry, you're the last couple of people in the country with a job, so you're going to have to pay more tax. But that's going to be quite upsetting. He may tell South Africans that they're going to have to pay more VAT, and that could be a burden that all of us are going to have to bear. Or he could say, we're going to borrow more money, not only from the World Bank or the New Development Bank, but he could also say, we're borrowing money from 2021, 22, and 23, because he's empowered to do that. And in so doing, look to trim expenditure over the next three years. That seems like a very likely outcome. Yeah, so the three possibilities uh, or the three options that the Minister of Finance essentially has, it's to either increase taxes, um, to increase borrowing, or to cut expenditure. Um, so the February budget already talked a lot about trimming the wage bill. Um, so the current wage bill accounts for just over 30% of government expenditure. The other components like infrastructure and goods and services account for a small portion of government expenditure. The other big portion is um, debt service costs. Um, so if he then decides that he's going to borrow more money, um, it means that they also need to budget more for servicing that debt. Um, so yeah, it, it becomes a bit of a predicament there. But we already know that they increased um, they increased debt, so, so they increased issuance in the market. So the debt to GDP profile is already expected to increase. So what does he do? I mean, what is the least worst outcome <laughs> of this emergency budget? Because there isn't a good outcome. There isn't a happy outcome. There isn't a, uh, oh, let's all feel as happy like we did when Trevor Manuel was finance minister and there were surpluses. Because those things, for now at least, are history. Mm, yeah. So I, I, I think the key things that we're likely to see is re, the reprioritization of budget. Um, so Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be it's going to be more detrimental to growth for government to cut the infrastructure project. Um, so they'll have to reprioritize some of the expenditure lines um, and put that and 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 put that budget more into productive use. So in, in, in the infrastructure spending um, on the tax side, if they increase taxes, if they increase the tax burden, that's also going to be detrimental to growth. Um, and we're now talking about a recovery. So we already know that we're going to have a huge slump in GDP, but we need to start thinking about the recovery. So they also need to talk about some stimulus package. Um, so we've had the stimulus package, which the government, with the, which the president fa uh, termed phase two. So it's the phase three that we're waiting for, which is going to concentrate on infrastructure, which is very um, important for the growth recovery. Um, so what, whatever they do, Bruce, they have to keep in mind what it means for the recovery, for growth recovery, because that's going to be very important. Otherwise, we remain in this very low growth trajectory. Thank you very much for your insights this evening. In a moment, the Reserve Bank will also talk to business as to what the outlook looks like and what their expectations are on this emergency budget, unprecedented emergency budget in unprecedented times. On to the Deputy Governor at the Reserve Bank now, Fundi Chazibana is a Deputy Governor at the Reserve Bank, which has taken extraordinary measures over the last three months to try to stimulate the South African economy with significant interest rate cuts and also a program to buy back government debt as a buyer of last resort, which is something that has calmed down financial markets. Now, Fundi, I know this is quite difficult from a central banker's perspective to communicate in layman's language. But the sort of steps that the governor and the Monetary Policy Committee and the Reserve Bank have taken during this time, I think, have contributed to largely to keeping uh, the big global financial wolf from the door. Bruce, what we did as a central bank was re responding to the stresses that we were seeing in our financial markets. So what we saw in the middle of March was that there was a lot of selling by the foreign holders of, of government bonds. So you are right in part that that relates to what was happening globally, but some of it also had to do with 
responding to the fears that global investors had around a credit rating downgrade for South Africa, which as you know, did indeed take place. So what we saw was an early sell off of government bonds, but we did not have sufficient buyers in the market. And what was happening was that the, the bids that were being made relative to what was available in the market, what all of us call bid offer spreads, uh, they were quite white and very thin uh, because of thin selling in, in, in thin buying in the market. So the Reserve Bank then took the decision to firstly provide funding to the banks to ensure that the banks could provide adequate funding to those who are asset managers who wanted to buy these bonds. And secondly, we then took a decision to also participate in the secondary market for government bonds uh, and to buy government bonds. And when we took this decision, it was also based on the decision that we needed to take to expand the toolkit that we have as a central bank to uh, actually ensure that financial markets continue to, uh, to function. So we have what we call the monetary policy portfolio, which is a range of tools that we can utilize either to add liquidity by providing money to the market or drain liquidity by taking money out of the market. So we started to buy government bonds, but the idea is that this tool is something that we will use to add liquidity and also to drain liquidity mm -hmm. at a later stage. So it's an instrument that you have as part of your monetary policy toolkit. So far, the market response has been good. We started to see a normalization of the functioning of markets. Although we did see an increase in, in sell-off towards the end of April, and this was because South Africa was removed from the World Government Bond Index. So there are investors that follow the Government Bond Index, and those investors are forced, when a country is yeah. no longer uh, investment grade, to, to sell off those, those bonds. But things are yeah. getting normalized now. Yeah, what, what it has achieved is a stabilization and it gives the yeah. finance minister a stronger platform from which to work. He's not going um, with financial markets collapsing around his ears where a massive bond sell-off is happening. He's not going into a chaotic environment when he stands up in parliament yeah. to deliver mm -hmm. this emergency budget. So it's served its purpose there. Now, around the world, investors and ordinary people have come to believe that this is now the job of central banks is to provide stability because in an environment where policymakers either can't or won't do it, central bankers are going to step in and do it in perpetuity. And I don't know if we can necessarily rely on that in South Africa forever. So central banks who's come in to, have come in to do two things, and certainly that's what we have done as a start, is firstly, we have reviewed where the inflation numbers are, and you would have heard the governor say that there is very little inflation in the economy right now, and there's likely going to be very few factors that will push up inflation in the period ahead. And that gave us the space as a monetary policy committee to cut interest rates. And that reduction in interest rates would have provided households and businesses the space that they need to deal with uh, the strains that they've had. Some of them have lost income, both businesses and households have lost income, and, and some of them are also facing strain in terms of uncertainties of future income. The second uh, duty that we have as a central bank is to ensure that the financial system as a whole remains stable. So in this regard, there were two sets of decisions. The first one we spoke about, which is ensuring that financial markets continue to function. The second one, is to ensure that the banks remain healthy. So we released the Financial Stability Review uh, just two weeks ago, which highlights that our banking system remains stable. And in part, we were allowed to do this because banks have been having buffers. So we forced banks to set aside what we call capital buffers. We've now had the space for the banks to reduce those capital buffers so that they can continue with lending. But all of these activities that we're doing as central banks, they don't replace the normal order of doing business. They don't replace the structural reforms that are required 
for, for the economy to, to pick up in a, in a certain direction. Uh, all of this is really higher grade stuff. I mean, for the vast yeah. majority of people, 99.999% of people, you may as well be speaking Greek. Um, they don't get a sense that this really matters to them, but ultimately it does because the stability of the financial system is the, the, the pivot upon which everything balances. If the financial system falls over, nothing else in an economy can function. And I think what we're trying to say is that we've achieved that relative stability to set the finance minister up for his medium-term budget policy. I, mean, not, I want to call it a medium-term budget policy, but the emergency budget next week. And he's got a huge job on his hands. I mean, as the Reserve Bank, can you do more? Should you do more to support him? Or is it now up to him and his political colleagues to take the decisions that are required, the structural reforms that you speak of? So we've said, Bruce, we, we will do more if we are required to do more. Within our mandate as a central bank, we've been very responsive in this crisis and we continue to monitor uh, areas where we need to respond as, as a central bank. There are certain things that a central bank cannot do that are the, in the realm of the, of the fiscal authorities. And of course, where the two areas come together is, is what um, is often called the sovereign bank nexus, yet more and more Greek that I'm introducing. So one of the things that are important to look at is whether the borrowing by the sovereign starts to have certain implications for the financial system and whether the system can continue to absorb that. But that is something, as you know, is not in the control of the central bank, but it is in the control of the treasury in terms of how much it borrows, and, and I think it's quite important that we've highlighted this as the NPC in the past, that taking decisions that are prudent, uh, that, that take into account the sustainability of growth going forward are, are quite important. Would I be over-exaggerating to suggest an image for you of a finance minister on a tightrope balancing over the gaping mouth of a volcano right now? Oh dear, Bruce. Uh, I don't know if I was Dito Moeni, maybe I, I, I would be uh, facing significant pressure. What I should reflect is that this issue around the strain that is faced by fiscal authorities is not one that is unique to South Africa. Around the world, we have seen that a number of countries, particularly those ones that already had elevated levels of debt, are in, in a lot of trouble right now. So we look forward to, to hearing the approach that the, the minister is, is going to take. And, and we, we have no doubt that, that it will be the best approach that, that is available to him. Udi Chazibana, thank you very much indeed, Deputy Governor at the Reserve Bank. In a moment, we'll talk to Busisiwe Mavuso at Business Leadership South Africa. And finally, this evening, we have the Chief Executive of Business Leadership South Africa, Busi Mavuso, with us as we look ahead to the Finance Minister's emergency budget next week. Just how afraid are you of the messaging that will emerge, Busi Mavuso? Thank you very much, Bruce. So I think this one is going to be a critical one. And it's interesting, Bruce, because with every budget, just like the February one, we keep on saying this one is going to be the critical one. But I guess this one, I think, really it's where the rubber is actually really going to have to hit the road. So the three main things that we are looking for as business from this budget, uh, Bruce, is number one, how is the 130 billion, you know, reallocation going to be done? Or where is the money going to come from? Because we know that as the president outlined in the 500 billion um, uh, stimulate, uh, the stimulus package, there's 130 billion that was actually going to come from, you know, some retweaking of the budget. It would be interesting if the finance minister can actually table in terms of where is it going to get the money from and are they winning in as far as that is concerned. And then I think the second one is actually going to be around how are we going to raise funds as a country to meet the significantly higher deficit. We know, for instance, that 
uh, economic modeling is showing that, that our deficit is going to be around 16%. You know, we were sitting at a deficit of about 6.3% in February, which totaled about 326 billion rands. We already thought that there was a lot. So that number has grown about threefold. You know, is there a plan in terms of what funding are we going to embark upon to ensure that we meet this big deficit? I think the third one for us is going to be some semblance or framing of the phase three, which is the economic strategy. What is that going to look like? Do we already have plans? You know, uh, what are some of the key and critical interventions that we're actually going to put in place to ensure that we change the economic trajectory of this country? And I think uh, 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 if the minister can speak to those three in the main, uh, Bruce, I think that will be critical. That is what we as business are looking forward to hearing. That is what investors are looking forward to hearing. And that is definitely what the international uh, community are looking forward to hearing. This is the long-awaited structural reform that we keep harping on about and keeps getting kicked down the road because it's an awkward political conversation for the finance minister and the ANC to have. How does Tita Bowenny balance the needs of the country in a desperate global environment against the needs and desires and wishes and dreams of his own party? You know... Bruce, if you look at the leaked ANC uh, economic strategy document that came out on the weekend, you will see that it looks as if there is now some form of understanding from the ANC that this notion of a developmental state does not necessarily mean public investment. You know, it therefore, you know, probably means that private sector investment is actually welcome as well, you know, because that thinking, let's agree, was narrow and it was flawed. And they admit as such, you know, in the document. So let's hope that, you know, uh, this starts to probably maybe give us an indication in terms of what the economic a strategy is going to look like. I think they also admit in that document that a government doesn't have to own the SOEs 100%. You know, there's going to have to be some degree of strategic equity partners. But I think they are going to have to be willing, Bruce, you know, to bring in significant a significant portion of the strategic equity partners, because if they're only going to give them, you know, a small shareholding, that is actually not going to work. But the president has also alluded to the fact that we are going to see an overhaul of the SOEs. And I'm hoping that we have used the word overhaul intentionally, because if you are overhauling something, it actually has to change the form and structure from what it was before. You can't overhaul something and it continues to look the same. I'm hoping that ownership is going to vastly change, you know, to the private sector, which is where it's supposed to be, by the way, Bruce, because let's agree that the role of the state is to ensure that the environment within which business operates is a conducive environment, and they should allow business to therefore come in and ensure that we drive the growth. It is not their job, you know, their job to make sure that they create jobs and that they drive the growth. So I'm hoping that the economic strategy is therefore going to start talking to that and that Tito is going to give us an idea of what that is going to look like. I mean, this is going to be the biggest waste of the most extraordinary crisis if we fail to grasp the opportunity that it presents us as a country, surely. It definitely is going to be because uh, I'm hoping that this actually, and I think what we have seen is actually very encouraging, Bruce. There's been, you know, a, 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 a form of a working flow, a close working relationship between business and government. There's been an acceleration of certain interventions that were actually needed to implement as a country. We have seen that finally the government is talking about you know, an accelerated release of the spectrum, which is what we've always been talking about. They've at speed, you know, managed to amend some of the competition rules to allow some of the institutions to work together, you know, in solving for this strategy. You know, we have seen some of the regulation that has actually been put together to ensure that as we ease through the different levels of the lockdown, you know, there's regulation that guides that. We have seen the releasing of the, you know, or allowing of the e-commerce so all of those have been done at a certain degree of speed. So I'm hoping that that momentum is not going to uh, actually uh, be, be wasted. I'm hoping that that momentum is not going to fade. We actually need to continue 
riding this bandwagon and ensure that we achieve what it is that we want to achieve. Remember, we are in a worse position as a country because we have just been downgraded to junk status. So this agency was already supposed to be there even before we were downgraded. Now that we are downgraded, it makes a bad situation worse. So I'm hoping that the acceleration and the speed and the agency that we have seen in terms of how the government have dealt with the health crisis is therefore going to apply in terms of how we deal with the economic crisis. If not, Bruce, unfortunately, we might just be one of the failed, you know, African states, you know, and we might actually be sitting with a collapsed economy because that is where we're quickly heading as a country. Yep, it is the opportunity of a lifetime. Busi Siwe Mavusa, thank you very much, Chief Executive of Business Leadership South Africa, ahead of their critical budget announcement, the emergency budget, coming on Wednesday. It's certainly a very, very difficult environment. My thanks to my guests for this evening, to Mpo Tsebe at RMB, also to Fundi Chazibana, who is a Deputy Governor at the Reserve Bank, and to Busi Mavuso. Chief Executive at Business Leadership South Africa. That uh, emergency budget plays out on Wednesday. It's going to be a huge, huge day. Brace yourself. It's not necessarily going to be comfortable. Looking for some optimism from the National Treasury and the Finance Minister. Is there one more rabbit left in the hat? We'll find out soon. Good night.